you make your way to your seat this morning, I want to welcome you today and glad that you are here to start off this Thanksgiving week. We're excited. I know we have a number of families that have already been able to leave and travel or out seeing family and thankful for that opportunity. How many of you are traveling somewhere this week for Thanksgiving holiday? How many of you have somebody traveling to you? And by traveling, I mean, like I say, further than like Goochland um, uh, or Dinwiddie. Somebody said it's a long trip, that 45 minutes that we have to drive to family. But uh, we're going to be traveling a little bit this week. Uh, I think ours is about 11 hours. So looking forward to that. <laughs> looking forward to getting there more than anything. And so thankful for that. But uh, glad that you're here with us this morning, and we want to give praise and thanks to our God each day and each week, not just the week of Thanksgiving, but it's a special week to be able to set aside some time with friends and with family, and I hope that you do that. I hope that you think and praise the Lord for all that He has done in your life uh, through His Word and through the Gospel and uh, through others, through those that He has brought into your life. Let's ask the Lord to help us and bless us this morning. As you pray, I want you to pray for your own heart this morning that God would speak to you and talk to you no matter where you are this morning, mentally, spiritually, even emotionally. Just ask the Lord to teach you today something about himself. And then let's pray for one another as we go to him and ask him to help us. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your glory that you show us through your word. I thank you for each of these people that are here with us this morning and Uh, Those that have already even begun to travel for the holiday season, I pray that you'd give them a safe journey on their way, encourage them. Sometimes uh, you can use a moment or a week like this to just greatly encourage someone's heart or soul by the change in schedule, the time with friends and others and, uh, and family. And so we pray that you would do that this week. I pray that you would help our church to be a testimony of you, of your praise and glory this week as we have opportunity to do so with our families and uh, as we set aside some time uh, this week to be with them. We just ask that you'd encourage. Uh, Be with us this morning in an evident way. Fill us with your spirit and uh, make it clear to us that you are living and dwelling in us and amongst us as a church family. Uh, We want to be just that. We want to be a family for you and for your glory. And so we pray for one another this morning. We pray for each of our hearts that whatever we have carried into this room this morning with us, that you would help us to see it uh, bathed and cleansed and covered by the truth of the gospel and your word today. Change our perspective to match yours. And may we submit and wholly uh, come to you in submission. Uh, Be with our time today. May we sing as we hear song, as we sing and participate in song. May it be pleasing to you as we rejoice in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 As you sing that song this morning, it's taken from Matthew, where we've been studying for some time. And there on the inside page, there's a little bit of a hymn story behind that Uh, Him and uh, behind that song, and you see there the author mentions that from 2005 to 2010, his pastor preached through the Gospel of Matthew. It's not going to take us quite five years to get through it um, unless we take about two and a half more years on the last two chapters, which is possible, uh, but I want you to see just how it impacted his heart and life and uh, the importance of our declaration that Jesus is the Christ, not just important and not just good, but He is God. And uh, if you would, uh, open your Bible to the book of Matthew this morning. We're going to see that again. And so Matthew chapter number 26. If you have your bulletin this morning as well, you can turn to that back insert page and look at some things that are coming up in our church and in our life and ministry and uh, some things to kind of look forward to and prepare for the next few weeks. And Uh, Most importantly for this week, notice there, November 21st, that is this Tuesday. So our normal midweek family Bible study service that we uh, have together is on Wednesday at 7. And notice it is not Wednesday at 7 this week. So don't come Wednesday at 7. Come Tuesday at 6.30. 
It gives us a little bit of extra time because it is a, a fellowship time as well, sort of a kickoff for some of those Thanksgiving days. Spend some time as a church family together. And it says, bring a dessert in your hand and a praise in your mouth. And so, uh, we'll, and when you get there, we'll be able to swap those. You can speak out your praise and put in your dessert. And so, I hope that you'll plan and come and be a part of that and um, bring a dessert with you. It does not have to be a pie. Um, our schedule will be a little bit different this year. We're going to uh, have some testimony and song and then eat a little bit at the same time and have testimony and song. There's, there's a little bit of a, all kinds of churches do this particular type of event. And I have noticed this tendency for picking names. We have this way of like, oh, I'm not going to call it this. I'm going to call it this. And I've seen a lot of people, it's praise and pie. We prefer pr that praise we prioritize over the pie. We're going to have them both at the same time. Of course, we prioritize. And actually, the pie is going to be a little bit earlier this year. And so I uh, plan on coming and uh, being here Tuesday and being a part of that at uh, 630 Tuesday evening. And uh, make sure you kind of plug that in. Um, so that you're here, and if you can't get here right on time, 6.30, that's fine, because of work, whatever, just come on and uh, be a part of that, and uh, celebrate together. Be thinking about something good that God has done in your life. We want to praise the Lord, even just for His goodness and for His greatness, and what we know and have learned about Him. And so be thinking on those things. And then some upcoming dates in the next few weeks. Uh, you see there our Christmas concert, December 10th. Uh, at 5 o'clock, that'll be a Sunday evening, and that's going to be Adam Davis and uh, a number of his folks there at Alive Ministries, a music ministry where he has written and arranged quite a number of songs. These will be Christmas songs and a full Christmas concert that evening that they'll be coming in and singing and being part of, so uh, and invite others to come with you, friends and uh, family. I know a few from uh, even other churches that are going to be with us that evening as part of uh, some of their church service coming over and being a part of it. And so I uh, just want to be a, a blessing to those that we can. So come and be a part of that as well. And then notice in the middle there, and I explained this a little bit Wednesday night. I'll give it to you again if you were not here. But our Christmas fellowships this year, instead of doing a large Christmas luncheon after a morning service or a big event with everyone all at once, uh, like we did last week, a good time last week at our uh, fall festival, an opportunity to just be around one another, encourage one another. Uh, this year, we're going to do a number of small ones, and they're at my house. And uh, I, like I said, Wednesday, yes, I did talk to my wife about this ahead of time. She knows, and she's okay with it. In fact, I hear that uh, somebody saw it all this morning and said, is he crazy? I'm not going to point out who that person was that said that, but they said, are you see crazy? Yes, we are. And uh, we want to have uh, folks over and have the opportunity to fellowship in some of these smaller gatherings and give you a little bit of chance to learn and know people from the church. And so whether you're a part of our church, a member of our church, or you've been uh, visiting or coming or just kind of getting to know us, anyone is invited to those. I think there's eight or nine different um, time slots. They're on different days. Uh, there's a, a Sunday. I think there's one Sunday. Uh, there's several Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, there's three, I think, time slots at noon, and so if a midday works better for you, not driving at night, that kind of thing, and uh, your schedule, depending on, we have a couple people that are off on Mondays, uh, you can come on at that time slot, and then there's several that are in the evening, 6 or 6.30, and so those are all laid out on the Welcome Center. Make sure you pay attention to the date and the time, uh, but we mean it. We want everybody that is part of our church or a friend of our church or coming in, bring a visitor with you. If you'd like to, a friend or a family member, that'd be uh, just fine as well. But we want to get to know you a little bit and just give the opportunity for people to be around each other. And uh, you'll see uh, when you sign up, we'll check with you on that and kind of confirm that time with you. Uh, depending on who's coming on what days, we may ask you to bring something small, a drink or a dessert, but we'll kind of provide the meal part, the lunch or dinner. And uh, hopefully you can come in and be a part of that uh, in the next few days. So sign up early. I think the first one is a week after Thanksgiving, so a week from this Thursday. And so sign up as quick as you can so that we have those, those time slots. There's kind of six or seven family spots per one. We're kind of going to limit it to that amount. Um, my house can only contain so many people at once on a cold winter's night. Uh, so if you miss out on that time slot, find Find another one there, bring the whole family, and I think it'll be something enjoyable for us 
uh, to be together and be a part of. All right, look if you would, Matthew 26 this morning. Matthew 26. <clears throat> and um, look down in verse number 47. We're going to pick up where we've been reading. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, feel free to use the one that's there. Recycling the seat around you, or in front of you, a brown back Bible. If you don't have a Bible that is your own, we want that to be our gift to you today. Just take it with you, and uh, that, that'll be, uh, you can have that. We want everyone to have a copy of God's Word, and uh, we're glad that you're here with us today and uh, to be a part of it. So Matthew 26, look at verse 47 if you would. I'm going to read down through the end of the chapter today, and uh, we have entered sort of a narrative portion of the trial, the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion and death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus. This is the very center of our Christian faith. Uh, it is about this first and nothing else. Everything else in our world and universe as Christians centers around the fact that Jesus Christ, sinless Savior of the world, Son of God, came for this purpose. And these are the details around those events and the truth from those that saw it, witnessed it, and as God has given it to us in His Word. So look if you would, verse 47. This is Jesus speaking. He's just prayed. That's what we preached through last week. The prayer of Jesus in the garden. His soul was so sorrowful thinking about that cup, the wrath of God on Him, what it would be to be separated. We know that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God, three parts. And it's difficult for us to even understand what that is and comprehend, but it's the truth. And God says, I'm going to separate, uh, deal with that separation, forsake, if you would, as it is quoted by Christ on the cross, and uh, to be judged in wrath for the sins of others. And so he's thinking about that, and he prays, and then he commands his disciples to get up, knowing that Judas was coming. And in verse 47, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came. And with him a great multitude with swords and staves. That just means clubs, sticks. Uh, the Jews, remember, were under Roman occupation. And one of the facets or aspects of that is the Jews were not really allowed to readily have access to weapons. You sort of had to have permission for that. And so uh, many of them would just grab clubs and sticks, whatever they could find. And from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him, Judas, gave them a sign. So ahead of time, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. The word kiss there, we don't even have a verb that really does a tense that says the same thing, but it, it kind of says to repeat over and over. So it's the idea of very lovingly over and over on the cheek, just kissing over and over. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, to that disciple, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and stays for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against, him, against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. 
Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee, I apprehend you by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then they spit in his face and buffeted him. They beat him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came in unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out to the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, and I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they which stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee, his accent. Then began he to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Lord, help us this morning as we study this, your word. Um, it teaches us as we prepare our hearts for the next few weeks from this portion of Scripture to study your death and your sacrifice. May we learn from this, from who you are and for those that were around you. And may we apply it to our lives in Jesus. In Matthew 26 this morning, and um, as we read, I hope you feel the intensity of the passage that we have been studying these last few weeks, because I think we are meant to feel it. Um, as you get to this portion of Scripture, it can be easy. We've been studying this book for quite some time, the book of Matthew. And so our tendency can kind of be like any project. You get to the end of the project and you feel a little rushed, don't we? Uh, we, we want to get it done so we can say that we finished it. And I will confess, there were moments these last few weeks studying and planning out the next few weeks worth of sermons through Matthew, just trying to say, hey, we're going to take this passage or this group, and the tendency is to kind of want to press through it. It's kind of like, well, we know what happens, and so let's just, let's just get there and, and know and rejoice in that. But I hope that this morning and these next few weeks, we will let our minds and our hearts slow down and that we will ask the Lord to teach us. We cannot learn from the Word of God without God's Spirit. It doesn't matter how mature you are as a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter how many times you've read the Bible. You could have read the Bible a thousand times, over and over and over and over again. There are men that have read the Scriptures over and over and over that do not believe them. They read them for education. They read them for scholarship. There are people that have read them and read them and read them. And maybe there is a belief, but there's no submission to God's Spirit. And so there's no real actual growth and learning. And so this morning, as we walk through, we have been presented by Matthew with this amazing Savior King. But what Matthew has been echoing over and over and over again is that God has sent Jesus to be king over His kingdom but what he has told us so many times is that his kingdom is not like any other kingdom in this world. And when we measure God's kingdom by everything else that is around us, and we rule it or we judge it by our own sinful hearts, we will be left disappointed. We, we want God's kingdom to rule in the same way, but, 
There have been hundreds and thousands, if you would, of kingdoms and authorities and rulerships over people in this world throughout centuries and millennium. And have any of them ever just got it right? No. We misuse and abuse one another. We mistreat. We misuse for our own power. We take We destroy as a whole, as a human society. We do not build up into something that lasts. Sure, there be maybe moments of uh, of discipline. There may be moments of growth in a society or in a culture toward maybe some common good. But the theme is that if it if it lives long enough without the guidance of God and human beings in control, it eventually falls apart. And what we're going to see here this morning in Jesus being arrested, apprehended, and tried is a group of men and a group of people that take Jesus and and they take him and they arrest him and they put him on trial for his claim, you'll see in a moment, for being the Messiah, the chosen king of the Lord. And they say, there is no way you can be the chosen king of the Lord. You've committed blasphemy by saying you are from God. Well, why did they think that? Because he was not what they were looking for in their minds. Because he didn't do everything the way that all the other countries and societies and Rome and rulership did. Because he didn't give them what they wanted physically. Because he told them that the bigger issue was not the Roman army that was encamped around their cities, but it was the sin that had a stranglehold on their hearts. And they hated that message. They hated the fact that Jesus' primary concern was not a political one, but was a spiritual one. That he pointed into the depths of their soul and said, you have a problem. And we, if, if we're honest this morning, the, we may be, you may be a Christian, you may believe in Jesus as your Savior, There are moments where the men and the people that we're going to read about in this passage and the way that they interacted with Jesus, they did it not just on their own behalf, but in a way they did it on behalf of all humans. They are representative of what people do with God. What we have done since the very beginning in sinning against Him, in wanting other things outside of relationship with Him, And so when we study this, we're not just going to see, oh, there was Judas and he uh, betrayed. There was Peter and he denied. There was the leaders and they mistreated. No, there is also our own hearts. Because there's moments, even probably in this past week, that though we know what God's word says and we know the way of Jesus and that he says something should be very different about us and in our lives, that we should love him and love others. Some of us, myself included this week, mistreated others because what we found is that the way in the kingdom of Jesus didn't match the desire of my sinful heart. And so I picked self over Jesus several times this week. Probably many times, but I'm even blinded to that. And so as we look at this passage this morning, We're going to look at some of the technicalities of it. We're going to look at some of the history of it. But I want us to put our own hearts into it for just a moment. We saw last week the prayer of Jesus in the garden. The garden of Gethsemane. And he prays the intensity of the moment is building. As we read those 10 verses last week. And he's being pressed emotionally and spiritually. He he feels, in, in my opinion, his body goes through an anxiousness and a terror of sorts. Not in a, I'm afraid to do these things, but the body still that he had was a human, is a human body. He's fully God and fully man. And he knows what is coming. And he says, my my soul is in torment. I'm in this type of anguish, even unto death. Not anguish about death, but I am in so much emotional turmoil. It feels like I am going to die because of that. He's being pressed out, pressed down. And yet in that moment, he prays, he submits, he reveres the Father. And Jesus emerges, he is tested, he is tempted, just like we have been. But Jesus emerges victorious in prayer and he comes out of the garden. 
And the last thing he says in verse 46 of chapter 26, he says, Get up, rise, let us be going. He that is at hand that doth betray me. He didn't try to escape. He didn't try to worm his way out of it. He walked right into it. He shows us over and over again his sovereign control. Remember when we started this chapter and God had a plan all along? Remember the Passover of the Old Testament? Not to get too outside of ourselves, but see the beauty of the passage. Just observe the glory of it for a moment because years before, hundreds of years before, God brings his people out of Egypt and he says, I'm going to forgive you of your sins against me. I'm going to pass over you and the sacrifice, the Passover of the sacrificial lamb. And it, it, it is not that that lamb saved them from their sins, but it represented what was to come. And now Jesus is going to be the sacrifice that allows God to pass over the sins of mankind by faith and repentance in Him and believing in Him. People are going to be able to be restored to God in spite of their sin because of Jesus. Now remember at the beginning of the chapter, the leaders, the ones that wanted to kill Him, they said, we want to kill this man. He's bringing too much attention to us. We've finally gotten in with the Romans and they're not messing with us too much. We can't have this. We want to kill this man. But it says they didn't want to do it at the time of the Passover. Remember, they said, there's so many people here, so many people in Jerusalem. Let's kind of let this fade. They, they did not want to do it at that time because of the great multitude of people. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You're not in control of this. I am in control of this. And he orchestrates things to where not only do they crucify him before they want to, they crucify him symbolically at the time of the Passover itself. He orchestrates these things. He says, let's get up and go. Judas is here. Look at verse 47, if you would. While he spake, lo, Judas, notice this phrase, one of the twelve. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed by someone he loves and he has spent time with. And with him, there was a great multitude with swords and staves. Now, the word multitude there, we kind of picture maybe thousands and thousands of people. Now, the big crowds from Jerusalem have not come yet. In fact, that's one of the reasons that they're coming at night is because they don't want a big uprising. The people just laid down palms and said, Hosanna to this king of kings. They don't want all those people knowing that they're going to kill Jesus. So when you said multitudes, it's not yet all the people that have been convinced that Jesus is a criminal. This is like all of the host of the guards at the temple, the guards of the high priest. There's probably some Romans maybe as well because they didn't have the authority to do that on their own, but maybe Roman soldiers. There's the guard of the temple. There's Caiaphas, the high priest. His own servants are going on behalf of him. A, a, a whole host, a mob of people come. And when they come, they take Jesus. Jesus is betrayed by this kiss and it sets off in that moment. And I ever wondered why? Like, why do they need to do that? How do they not know who he is? Now remember, they don't live in a day of street lights and LEDs all over the place. <laughs> Things are fairly dark at nighttime. Most people, probably wisely, go to bed when it gets dark. They get up when it gets light. And so it, it's dim. They, they don't know exactly where Jesus is. And so Judas has to come and say, I know where he's going to be. I'll take you to him. Follow right on my coattails. And remember what he says, what he just told them. He said, I'm going to give him a kiss. And when I let go, you hold him fast. Jesus, uh, Judas knew Jesus' power, and yet he abandoned him anyway. Do not let go of him, he said. And it sets off this whole course of this trial. Jesus, though, says, Peter asks the question. You know, he pulls out his sword. Matthew actually doesn't tell us that it's Peter. That's interesting. But we're told in other gospel accounts that it is Peter that takes out his sword on guard prepared to die, you know, and he tries to kill the guy by cutting his head off, cuts his ear off instead. And notice Jesus' words about all that's about to happen in verse 54, 53 and 54. It says, all they, put up your sword. Everyone that takes the sword is going to perish by it. He says, again, Peter, I am not like the world's kingdoms. I don't have to win by battle. Then he says, to him, he says, I can call all the help I needed angels to conquer the world, yet... I'm not going to do that, verse 54, because the scriptures must be fulfilled because it must be this way. You see the love in Jesus' heart as he says, this has to happen. If people are going to be restored to God, 
If you're going to have a relationship with God as human beings and as sinners that have done wrong in our part, and, and we know that in our heart, we, I think that most human beings have an understanding or a grip that there is a creator, there is a God, there is a higher power, but we also naturally have an understation, uh, understanding that we don't know him naturally. We can't see him. We can't interact with him. Something is wrong that we cannot do that. And so as we enter this passage, again, like last week, there's two layers. There's a layer in which we observe and a layer in which we apply. An exemplary layer that says, you know, sometimes we treat the Bible all this way. Turn to the book of Matthew 26, subsection 75, discipleship manual on Peter, here's what he did. Here's what we should do. Here's what he didn't do. Here's what we shouldn't do. You know, and we go back and forth, but there's more to it. We should observe the glory and the beauty, the, the irony and the pain and the glory, the one that is the Savior, the hope for the world. And so this morning, I want us to examine for just a moment some of what is going on in the events and the details, sort of a setup sermon for next week, but there is still there's stinging detail and passion here. We see the cruelty of sin of humans in this people that we read about. But we see them, as I mentioned, live it out on our behalf. It is intense and it is indicative of our own hearts. We see people who viewed themselves as right and religious. They viewed themselves as the authority on God and put to death the one who countered their view of themselves and of their God. They were angry because he objected to their form of religion. They make themselves the center. We walk through this trial of Jesus, specifically this morning, this apprehending, this arresting. What is happening? The God of all justice and right is being put on trial and questioned. Sin ruins and destroys. God reverses and does good. Don't let society in this world convince us Otherwise, do you see the, the, the almost microcosm in this moment that really is indicative of everything that's been happening in this world throughout all of time? We as human beings and as culture, as people, societies, and obviously even today as a country, we put God on trial. We judge him by our own understanding of how the world works. We declare whether he is good or whether he is not. We approve or we disprove or disapprove of what he is doing and how things are happening in this world. We still do it today. So when we observe, let's be caught up in the wonder, the terror, the awe. Stunned, can you imagine God being arrested by the very people he created? There's nothing more that could clearly display the condemnation and the guiltiness of human beings than that they arrest their creator and put him on trial. And yet there is also nothing else that could display the mercy of God and his love. So in this moment, there is no more two clear examples of man's sin and God's mercy. Let's notice, if you will, I'm going to point out, we're not going to spend long on this part this morning, but I, I want you to notice and think about a couple of things because it, it goes and ebbs and flows what people emphasize. But we can have peace with God in relationship with Christ, our Savior, through this sacrifice. The peace was brought through an egregious betrayal, a faulty arrest, a stunning denial, and then a dirty legal proceeding. And yet there's some people in this world today that kind of argue and would say, well, no, Jesus, actually, if we go back historically, the death that he died, he was convicted rightly of doing wrong in the laws of their time. And it's a sham. I want you to think about some things about, you study out some of their culture and some of what was historically acceptable by law at that time, what was legal. Now, some of the writings that we have of <coughs> what was legal was, for the writings we have that are formally written came just after the time of Christ, but we know that they were already being applied and in place during the time of Christ. And here's a few things that show us that the trial of Jesus itself was illegal. Number one, there was no possibility for a fair trial because the people accusing Jesus of something were also the people that, that established the authority to arrest him, and they were the same people that held the trial and then convicted him. 
Now, I don't know. There are some places in the world that things are like that. It is not a good judicial pattern. And it wasn't legal at that time. The second thing, according to Jewish law, criminal cases could not be tried during the Passover season or the day before the Sabbath. There's a few different reasons for that. When they would try a capital case, meaning a case in which if the person is found guilty, they will be put to death. They could not be tried the day before at the Sabbath because they could not make a guilty declaration. They could not say or give a guilty sentence on the same day of the trial. They had to wait a day for it to happen. Now, if the Sabbath was the next day, they couldn't convene on the Sabbath. Now, in our minds, in our legal proceedings today, things can draw out for months and months and months. They didn't like to do that. They said, we need to wait a day before we declare guilty so we can think about it because this is important. But we also don't want to wait too long because there's other things that can interfere. So they wouldn't try people the day before the Sabbath, which they do, and they wouldn't try people right before the Passover and the feast, which they also do. According to Jewish law, a trial has to begin by bringing forth evidence first to allow someone to prove their innocence before you present proof or evidence that would show them as being guilty. Kind of an interesting pattern, but that was always the way that it would work. They say, you've been accused of this. Tell us how you are innocent. Jesus never gets that opportunity. Not first. They should have looked for witnesses after the trial started. Uh, They should not have looked for witnesses after the trial has started. According to Jewish law, when a trial starts, it is when the, the witnesses come forward to testify. We are going to trial because we have witnesses, not we are going to go to trial and then find witnesses. They go out looking for false witnesses. A capital trial like this was illegal to have at night for a variety of reasons. But remember what I mentioned a few moments ago with the dimness of the light. They would not have lights in this room. We're going to have a trial in this room in our very dark auditorium with no natural light and windows, if we were going to have that in here by candlelight or by torchlight, yeah, it's you stand somebody up here and in the blackness with just a few flickering lights, have somebody else say, yes, that's the man that committed that crime. There's a whole lot of things that could go wrong with that. The other thing, I don't know about you, if if you are hungry and it's dinner time, right? You want to go home, you want to eat, you're tired and you're sleepy. Do you make wise decisions in those moments? No, you go to the grocery store while you're really hungry or, or you try to make financial decisions in purchasing Christmas when you're exhausted and tired and you just want to go home, you, you make foolish decisions. So they wouldn't make these trials at night and yet here they did. According to Jewish law, all evidence had to be guaranteed by two witnesses. Not only could they not at first find two witnesses, it says that many came forward and none of them were agreeing. Finally, two of them sort of agreed on the same thing. The judgment should have been delayed till the next day. Like I mentioned, that was Jewish law. They, they weren't supposed to make a conviction on the same day that they held the trial. And yet here they do that as well. They would have argued that there were separate parts of the trial. They didn't condemn Jesus until the next day. But because the trial went through the night, it was all part of the same process. Here's this. According to Jewish law at the time, false witness, perjury in a sense, was punishable by death. Now, wait a second. Notice, if you would, down in verse... uh, Look down. I've lost my place here. Look down in verse number 60. So they tried to find false witnesses to put him to death. They found none. But notice verse 60. Notice the middle. Yea, though many false witnesses came, many people tried to get on the high priest's good side by lying or saying something about Jesus, and they kept finding it false. Now, wait a second. If it's condemnable by death, and many people did it, why are we not dealing with the others? Because they're so hyper-focused, because the criminal case of Christ is a sham. Jesus was not found guilty by any actual law of man or of God. According to Jewish law, they were supposed to consider the testimony of the one being accused, and they never did that. Even when he comes to the accusation of blasphemy, they never reckon or reason, they hear Jesus' statement and take it as he's saying is the Messiah. But they never lay out any facts or allow Jesus to show how he is the Messiah. They weren't looking for a real Messiah. That's not at all what they were searching for. And they definitely weren't looking for one like Jesus. It's not even devious. Their plan is blatant. 
And I want us to think about how the world treats Christ even today. There's some that argue. Again, they say that Jesus was killed in a fair and judicious trial. You say, I don't know if you even heard that. Ben Shapiro, one of the most famous conservative political voices in the world right now at this point, just about two and a half, three weeks ago, was on the most famous, most listened to podcast in the entire world. He had this to say when he was asked about Christ. There's a lot that has kind of come out about Jews and Israel and the land and different things. Recently, he was questioned about Jesus Christ. And they said, well, you know, what do you believe about him? And do you, believe, do you believe he's a prophet? He said, no, 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 we don't believe he's a prophet. And the host said, well, what is, what is he? Here's this quote. He was a Jew that led a revolt against the Romans that was killed for his trouble. Like a lot of other Jews who tried to lead revolts against the Romans and were killed for their trouble. He was no different than them. Now, my Bible says he was not killed because he led a revolt against the Romans. My Bible says he was murdered by his own people under a trial that crossed every legal line imaginable in that day. Jesus was not guilty. He is sinless. And yet, he walks toward this death willingly. I brought those things up to point our minds to it. And then I want to just kind of close with a little bit of We've observed, and, and I want us to examine and apply it to our own hearts. You have some of these things in your notes today, and you'll be able to kind of say, I'm just going to walk through them very quickly this morning to just, just point out some things about our own hearts and then about Christ. I want you to first see there's, there's really four groups of people in the passage. And you say, we just got to the notes, and it is almost 11 o'clock. I promise. What you have in your notes is what we're going to cover. But I want you to think about it this morning. The enemies of Jesus. Some of them were religious, others were not, but all of them came to this assumption. Rome and the Jews, all alike, decided that Jesus was a threat that needed to be dealt with. And I want you to think about this and see if it echoes. When you talk about Jesus Christ, when you live for Jesus in today's world, when you talk about why you do, when you commit yourself to parent a certain way, to work a certain way, to live a certain way and follow his teachings, do you ever experience this type of opinion? Notice this, they regarded him as something special, but they feared him as being dangerous. You ever sense that in our world today? That knows something about Jesus in the Bible. It's a sacred book. It's probably got some good things in it, but it's dangerous as well. It's against what we think should be happening in today's world. We put the Bible, we put God on trial in our society. And when it doesn't match with what we think it should, we say that that is dangerous because it is against our opinions. No, no, no. What is dangerous is rebelling against the holy God of the universe who holds everyone in the hand of his judgment. And if at the end of your life you have not obeyed the gospel admitted and come to him confessing your sin, trusting only him for forgiveness, then you are in his hands. That is dangerous. They listened to him as a teacher, but they confronted him as a criminal. Remember, they come to arrest him, and Jesus even says to him, he says, why, why didn't I taught you in the synagogue or in, in the temple. Why didn't you come arrest me then? You've come to get me like a robber as soldier stays i was teaching you verse 55 daily and you never grabbed hold of me they listened to him with intrigue but they would not submit in their hearts there are people that listen to jesus they want to add the concepts of judeo christianity and the bible into their hearts but when it comes to actually submitting to it it's criminal they rejected him as the messiah but they did this on their own terms and I think our world today struggles with the same thing. We live in a society that fears Jesus as dangerous, that treats his teachings as criminal because they are against the opinion. Now, let me ask you this morning, are you willing to stand for and with Christ even when the world around you says that person is dangerous, that person is criminal? Are you willing to say Jesus is still God and Messiah? I must follow him. Two of Jesus' followers were not. Judas comes and betrays Jesus with a kiss at night. I want you to think about some things about Judas that we read in the verses 47 through 50. Notice it says he's one of the twelve. 
It's, it's odd. It's this odd irony dynamic that when the Bible presents us Judas, it, it confronts us with his issue of his heart. We know who he is and what he is deep down, yet he also takes part in all of it. He gets to be a part of the miracles. It didn't say that when they had the 5,000 loaves and, and the fish and all the things, 5,000 people and the fish and the loaves all left over. It doesn't say there were 11 baskets because Jesus knew who Judas, Judas was. It doesn't say that. When he sent them out two by two, it doesn't say he got to the end. And he said he sent out one because he didn't let Judas go. He was part of the 12 the whole time. Experienced what they experienced. Saw what they saw. Jesus treated him with mercy, and yet he rebelled. He had the opportunity to follow Jesus, but rejected Jesus because of his ministry and his purpose. Judas stood to gain too little. He measured what Jesus said was important versus what he said was important, and he said, these don't match up. And we can sit in church. You say, well, I, that's not me. I, I've been a church member. I've been reading. I read my Bible. I do these things. I live a certain way. Judas walked with Jesus for three straight years, slept where he slept, ate what he ate, sat at the table with him for three years, and yet would not be convinced that Jesus' way was best. We can also sit in church and hear things and then go out and live our lives and in certain aspects of them choose and say, that's not the best. His ministry, his purpose and also, he viewed Jesus, notice this is supernatural, but he didn't submit to him. Remember, the almost fear, he says, he came to Jesus. Hail, Master, he kissed him. But remember, he says, whoever I kiss, you hold him fast. Guard him with swords. He knew Jesus was something great and special. But he also said, Jesus is not for me, personally. I want to be around it. I want to experience it. I want to benefit from it. But I don't want to obey it. There's probably more of Judas in our hearts than we want to admit and realize. The heart of Jesus can be found in our own outwardly with his lips and his words. He declares allegiance and love, but inwardly he was discontent. He was rebellious. He was callous. And I want you to think about this for a moment. It's not right in our text today. It's just a couple of chapters before. Remember we saw that woman that broke open the alabaster box, she weeped over Jesus, she wiped his feet, she, she served him. And what did G Judas do? He was hypercritical. A heart that is around Jesus, that wants to be a part of the power, the glory, that wants to have a good conscience, that recognizes Jesus as great, but will not submit to him individually, one of the signs or characteristics of that is being hypercritical of others in their worship and service of Jesus. You remember what he said? Oh, that could have been sold and given to the poor. Like he says it with good words. He has good reasoning. He says it, but he is so critical of those that actually love and see the beauty of Jesus. Is that in our own hearts as well? Where we look at others and we say, well, they're not like me. Uh, my life, I don't do the same things that they do. Fill in the blank with how and why and which direction. I'm not even going into all those things today. But are we hypercritical of those that worship and serve God because our hearts are actually cold toward Him? Then you see Peter, who shows us that following Jesus can be full of big ups and downs, but the answer is still always to return to Him. He misunderstood Jesus' purpose and mission. You see that? As Peter, he, he has zeal. He says, I, I want to serve Jesus. I don't want to rebel. I'm going to hold to him. He just said, I will die for you. I will die for Jesus. That's what Peter says. And he shows that his heart and his words are not separate. He actually means it. He stands up with a sword in the midst of a mob that is armed pulls out a sword and says, we're going to die today if we have to. I'm going to fight with Jesus. If Jesus dies, I'm dying. I'm convinced that Peter actually really felt that way. Now, he, he may have had faith to say, well, Jesus can set us free. He's, he's done all these other miracles. Whew, he pulls out his sword. We're going to actually conquer them. But I truly believe that Peter in his heart was saying here, Jesus has done too much. If he dies, I'll die with him. I really believe that. He pulls out his sword, he chops off a guy's ear. And Jesus stops, he says, no, 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 you've misunderstood. 
Peter, even in the intensity of this moment, when someone betrays and does us wrong, Peter, <coughs> Peter has just watched Judas, one of the twelve. Can you imagine the fury? No, not Judas, the one that keeps all the business stuff in check for us, the money and all, all the different things that we're supposed to be doing. No, he's got to be furious. And he says, we'll not let this happen. No, we're going to fight our way out of this. But Jesus says, even when someone has wronged us and betrayed us, and even when it feels like everything is crumbling around us that you have thought and believed, we are not like everything and everyone else. We don't live like them. And not in a sense of the enemy, but in a sense of love. We don't counter, we don't take on their methods. They come with swords and spears and clubs and sticks. We don't do that. And Peter misunderstands Jesus' purpose and mission. And then notice Peter also misunderstood his place in relation. He thought he was going to save Jesus. He thought Jesus needed him. He thought, oh, Jesus, I've been waiting for this. For three years we've been feeding people and making people better and healing people. I knew this time would come. Now Jesus needs me. And he pulls out his sword, trying to save Jesus, not understanding that the kingdom of Jesus is so different and that Peter is actually the one that needs saving himself. Not by a sword, but by a cross. And he says, this is so different, Peter. And I want you to notice his reaction. Because we think, Peter, he just nasty, deny, he's a wimp, right? No. I really think Peter, with good intention, was willing to die for Jesus and was willing to kill for Jesus. But when he realized that Jesus did not need those two things, he didn't know what to do. He totally lost his identity. So if Jesus doesn't need me, then what in the world am I here for? He follows along and he's confused. He sees Jesus at trial and he sits outside and a girl comes to him and at first it's a young maid who confronts Peter in front of everyone. She speaks to Peter but out loud in front of others. Peter denies. He evades the question and then it progresses. Then she not only does she talk to Peter in front of the others, she talks to the others about Peter and then he says no, no, no and he swears on it. He makes an oath. It grows. It gets more firm. Then the rest of them come say they're convinced by her. Yeah, you do. You have the same Galilean accent. Kind of a redneck accent is what they would have thought of. He's out from the rural part of the country. You must be part of him. And he curses because he says, no, I don't know him. Because in that moment, is it because he hated Jesus? No. I think it's because his world was shattered because he realized he had totally misunderstood, confused by what Jesus was doing. Now that is applicable to our lives because you and I are never going to sit and watch Jesus somewhere in a courtroom, be tried and beaten. But you and I are going to sit in life and be confused by what in the world is he doing. And in that moment, he shrunk away. And Peter says, until I understand, I'm going to distance myself from you. Now, there's something important. We're going to, we're going to close with this. We're going to tie it together with this because we're not just supposed to look at this and see the meanness of the crowd, the betrayal of Judas, And the denial of Peter. Because what we see is greater than that. We see the forgiveness of Christ. We see Jesus. Who displays God's sovereign control. And his knowledge. Over and over and over. He was never taken by surprise. He didn't try to escape. But he orchestrated his own death. Why? So he could die for us. We'll see that when we come to the next chapter. He showed commitment to God's purpose and plan. Now, like everybody, who, I don't remember who it was. I think it, it was a boxer or some, maybe Mike Tyson or somebody, the famous quote, you know, so and so, here's his game plan for fighting. Everybody's got a plan until they get knocked in the mouth. You know, that's what, so they say, everybody, it's easy to have a plan and wait, here's how I'm going to live my life. But when life comes crashing and smacks you in the face, and in this case, Jesus literally is smacked in the face, but he does not deviate from God's purpose and plan. He's committed to it, even when those around him are not. Even when his disciples go astray and the world seems to overwhelm, he remains committed. 
Now you can look at that two ways. Observe and behold His glory and be thankful for it. And also exempt for you and say, I, I should do that too. We can only do that through the power of Christ. Notice He remained faithful to God, full of grace and love to others. We're not told in this passage, but in another, we're told He picks up the ear and supernaturally heals it and puts it back on. We know the way that he speaks to Judas, friend. He says, companion, why are you here? Knowing full well, yet he extends off of his lips the word friend, mercy, to the person even that's going to betray him. And then even to Peter. I want you to turn very quickly. This, is where we're going to, this will be the last little section of verses we read. Look at Luke 22, if you would. Luke 22, and we're going to be down near verse 28 in just a moment. Jesus is so merciful. And he is to you and I. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we studied the passage of Scripture where it says, Jesus tells his disciples, you're all going to deny me. You're all going to run away from me. This wasn't just exclusive to Judas and Peter. In fact, Judas and Peter had a very similar problem, but there ended up being a different outcome. We'll talk about why that is in the next few weeks. Jesus called them all back for mercy. Jesus gave grace to each of them. But he knew the disciples were going to fail, and yet he still said, but I'm going to go before you into Galilee. I'm going to call you back to myself. Jesus, to the very end, I mean, can you imagine? Jesus is standing up there being tried, remaining silent so that he will suffer for the sins of all mankind. The only thing he can be accused of is telling the truth of who he is and being loving. And Peter, bold Peter, who a minute ago wanted to kill somebody, stands outside and a little girl asks him, a maiden it says, a young maid asks him about what he thinks or believes about this Jesus. And he said, I don't ever even heard of him. And let's be honest, our lives fit there, don't they? Like we have a Bible, we're bold in here. You are the Christ, son of the living God. Until I go to Walmart and somebody gets ticked off and then I, I don't say anything about Christ. Until I go to work. Till someone asks me. And as easy as it is to feel guilt and shame for that, I want us to see the beauty of God's grace. Look at Luke 22, verse 28. This is Jesus' words to his disciples. It's, it's kind of a parallel section to where we are in Matthew. But notice what he says. You are they. You are there. Verse 28. He's talking to the disciples. You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. You've stuck with me when I've been tested. Now, wait a second. They're literally about to betray him and deny him. And Jesus says, I, I'm so glad that you are with me. You stay with me. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father appointed me, that you may eat and drink at my table and my kingdom and sit on the throne, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to be rewarded for your commitment. But notice verse 31. Jesus knows this is just before the garden in Gethsemane. We're told of some, another conversation he has with Peter. Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter, behold, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. That he just shred your life to pieces. Take what he wants and then leave the rest behind. Do you feel like that in your life sometimes? Does Satan just wants you. Jesus knows that Satan wants you. He knows what's been going on in your mind and your heart. He knows what has been tormenting you. He knows the guilt and the shame that you have. He knows that you came with good intentions today to sing and to praise. But he knows that you're going to blurt out something nasty. Or he knows that you're going to laugh at something you shouldn't. Or he knows that you're going to watch or observe things. He knows that you're going to partake or be a part of something that is mean and doesn't fit his kingdom and his way. He knows that that is coming. In your life. Verse 32. But I have prayed for thee. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted. The word converted there literally means turned back. And when you have been changed. When you have been turned back. Strengthen thy brethren. Jesus knew ahead of time. That Peter would fail. And yet he planned. For mercy. We're closing with that this morning that Jesus to the very end declared the difference of God's kingdom and everyone else. Jesus is being put to death because people don't like him. And yet Jesus is extending forgiveness even when people betray him. 
You're not going to live a perfect life this week. It's not going to happen. We can pretend it will. But we would be better off to be honest and know that I'm going to sin this week. And yet I have a merciful Savior who has said, I, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you come back, I will use you. Did you notice that? It's not when you come back, I'll hold you and tell you how bad you are. When you come back, strengthen your brethren. And so this morning, I don't know where you are spiritually. Maybe you feel more like Judas or Peter than you want to out loud admit. The call of Jesus in the gospel to you is the same. Return and be used by God. There's no waiting period there. It's not, well, return and when I am done being bitter at you, then I'll treat you. No, no, no. return and serve. Maybe that's you this morning. Your heart's cold this week. And what, however it is, whatever it is that you've been doing in your life, the sin that we've committed against the Lord, His call to us is to repent, turn from that sin, and come home and serve Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your mercy and goodness and Your grace. We see the beauty of the cross of Christ, the joy, the satisfaction of being made known to and by our Creator. Having relationship with You, there is nothing like it. So this morning, Lord, even as I pray, pray and speak on Your behalf, that to those that are in this auditorium this morning that may not be believers, that may wonder where they sit in terms of their relationship with God and who is Jesus and you're calling us to believe, to repent. Say, we are sinners, but you're a Savior. And we thank you that over the next few weeks as we study your death, that we can know that it is on our behalf. But Lord, those of us that are Christians, I pray intently this morning, may we see and observe the glory. There is beauty in Jesus Christ. The world has painted a very different picture. Chauvinistic, legalistic. A, a, a savior of hatred. A prophet of doom. Yet when we look at your word, we see the heart of God lived out on the pages of your word. And you tell us by your life over and over that you love us. We see that today. We honor and glorify you for it. We ask that you'd help us to bask and bathe in the love of Christ. To be encouraged and renewed by it. And Lord, we've tried this week and this month, this year. We've been trying to live in a way in which we will not feel so guilty. To not do as much wrong. And we should. You call us away from sin toward righteousness. But you do that in your mercy. And so, Lord, help us to see today, you, like Peter, you have said, when you turn back, I will love you. When you turn back, I will care for you. When you turn back, I will use you. So may we return to you this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Stand if you would. We're going to sing this song near the cross. May our minds and hearts be near that cross thinking about the love of Jesus for us here at this altar near your seat let the Lord do work in your heart and life again if you're not a believer you're not a Christian unsure you're welcome at any point in the invitation to come forward there's other there's people here that'll take you to a room and tell you how you can know for sure that you have a relationship with your creator God I'll be around after the service come see me talk to me there's nothing that would give more joy than to just help you know see Christ for who he is. Let's sing this morning. Allow the Lord to work in us. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious Yeah.
I hope you'll be back this evening. A number of things going on tonight that are special. Tuesday night, uh, come a little early, 6.30. I'll be down in the gym and uh, bring a dessert, just a little bit to share as well. I know tonight the kids' clubs have a turkey trot down in the gym. I thought it had something to do with act like turkeys racing. It does not. I was highly disappointed. But the kids are going to run around, and uh, some of you have been asked about helping support them for our Christmas missions. We're going to start that up next week in here, but they're kind of jumping into that, raising some money for uh, church planting and for some missions projects uh, through our church, and so they're going to be doing that tonight. Ladies and men each have a Bible study. Ladies in here, men back in uh, the chapel, and a couple of special things going on in both of those. The ladies are having someone who's never taught here before, and you're going to have to come find out who it is. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, it'll be exciting. And then uh, men, just a time of testimony that we had a couple weeks ago. We're going to build off of that a little bit tonight and do a Bible study together and uh, be trying to nurture and grow in our relationships with Christ in the days ahead. Uh, Brother Stan, would you close?